Thank you, Steve. Um, we are collaborating with uh, Louisiana State University, LSU, on a book on fake news um, from a historical perspective, which should be out in ebook form uh, this summer. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to introduce each person in turn. Larry Noble is Senior Director of Ethics and General Counsel at the Campaign Legal Center, which is the leading nonpartisan, nonprofit voice on matters pertaining to campaign finance reform and has been so for 20 years. Um, Larry was also uh, general counsel at the Federal Election Commission for 13 years. Randall Rothenberg is president and CEO of the Interactive Advertising Bureau, an association of 650 uh, plus companies. Some of you may be members, you all should be members. So let me start with you, Larry. Uh, in October, Senators McCain, Klobuchar, and Warner introduced, with House members as well, uh, the Honest Ads Act. And in classic Washington tradition, honest is an acronym. So if you see a tweet with somebody writing honest in all caps, it doesn't necessarily mean they're shouting. It means they're referring to the acronym. And honest, in this case, stands for holding online national electioneering to the same test. What does that mean? What's the test? Well, the test, really the model for it is the, um, what is used now for television and the public file model. That is really what the test was. I do think somewhere in the government there's an agency that comes up with these acronyms because you have to have them. Um, I would also like to point out I'm actually not any more senior director for ethics. We have Walt Schaub from the uh, former, formerly of Office of Government Ethics who handles ethics now at our office, so we're very pleased with that. Um, so what is the Honest Ads Act? The Honest Ads Act is an attempt to get at some of the problems that came up in this election with the Russian influence and the spread of political advertising on Google and Facebook and the problem of not knowing where the ads come from. The um, one thing you have to understand about these ads and the regulation, under the campaign finance laws, things are only regulated if they cost money. The early theory of the regulation of the internet was things don't cost money. Anybody can get on and do things for free. But that's become, it's become apparent that's not the right model to use. First of all, people do spend a lot of money on the internet. And second of all, it doesn't really deal with the, um, with the actual influence these ads have. So what the Honest Ads Act does is it, under the Federal Election Campaign Finance Laws, it applies basically the rules that would apply to print ads or television to campaign finance ads for disclaimer purposes. That means if they have express advocacy, um, that um, um, they will have to have a disclaimer. If they have electioneering communications, they will have to have a disclaimer. Uh, the second part of it, though, is the part that's the public file part. And that's the part where the burden really falls on the, the various platforms, like Google or Facebook. And what it does there is require them to get information from their advertisers and make that information public. And again, it was modeled after what was done with the um, Federal Communications Commission and television. And the, and the thought behind that is that these large internet providers or platforms um, have really become the uh, equivalent of what the broadcast stations used to be. Um, in terms of their reach, in terms of their influence, and that they, 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 can, they can now deal with a certain amount of regulation and a certain obligation to society, to, to our government, to our, to our uh, former democracy in terms of providing information. So it puts a burden on them, and basically it requires them to record, the, keep copies of the ads, to um, uh, disclose who is behind the ads, um, and to provide, again, all the same information that the FCC, they have to provide the FCC if you're a broadcast station. But if the ad doesn't mention the name of a candidate, it walks, right? Not necessarily. So this is what's interesting about it now. Under the disclaimer rules for what has to be on the ad itself, um, you either have to have express advocacy of a candidate or mention the name of a candidate. For the purposes of the public file, it now also covers um, legislative issues of national importance. So it brought over the idea from the, again, the Federal Communications Commission's regulation that if you're talking about a legislative issue of national importance, then it's covered by the law in terms of keeping the records of the, of the platforms having to keep the records. It doesn't trigger a disclaimer, but it does trigger the keeping of the records. Does this thing have a chance of passing? Hope springs eternal. Um, I think it does have a, a, a chance of passing, not necessarily right now. 
Uh, but I think it does. Um, whether it will be modified before it passes is a, is a, a good question. Often this, this, type of, this type of legislation is introduced and then there are modifications to it. But I do think something will pass and I think this will be the model for what will pass. I think people are getting more and more frustrated with what's going on. I think that uh, this last election scared a lot of people in terms of the uh, known unknown, um, that the, all the uh, ads that were taken and all of the interactions that were done by a foreign government. And I think people want some some resolution. Now, the trick in this is that how do you have a resolution of these things at the same time with recognizing First Amendment rights and the basic values of a democracy? I think there is a solution to it. I don't think this is too burdensome. And I think we're going to see something happen in the relatively near future. So, and this is a transitional question to, to Randall. You've also um, had some things to say about transparency on the part of Twitter and Facebook. Uh, in October, you called Twitter's new transparency policy a small step forward and that Facebook was lagging by comparison. Is that still the case? To a certain extent. I mean, they've gotten better at it, but to a certain extent. And look, the history of Facebook and, and, and Google um, on these things, is, especially with the Federal Election Commission, has been to pretty much either oppose any effort to regulate, or um, this is around 2010, 2011, or to be silent and not really say anything. Um, and I think that's a real problem. I think they've been really slow to the table to recognize what their obligation is. And they're not the first industry to face this, that when they're slow to the table, what you then have is the government steps in and says, we're going to have to regulate it, and all of a sudden they become very interested in regulation and how it's going to happen. But they may have gotten a little bit better on it, but there's still an awful lot that they're not telling us, um, and they are, I think, still very reluctant to have any real regulation. Thanks. We'll come back to you in a minute. Randall, this is bigger than government and campaign finance, isn't it, this fake news problem? Uh, you gave a speech to your people a year ago in which you all but called it an existential crisis for democratic capitalism, uh, that fake news depletes truth and trust, and you spoke about the supply chain. Say more about sort of taking how this threatens society um, beyond uh, the capacity of government to regulate it um, and whether or not it's appropriate for government to regulate it and what else can be done since it's bigger than government? Right, so uh, the way I'd start is with terminology that is probably not um, everyday terminology for folks in the room. Um, and that is the concept of a supply chain, which is second nature to anyone working in the industrial economy. Supply chain is how things get from concept and raw materials to finished goods or services uh, at the consumers. And, and in the media and advertising business, historically, there's not really um, a sense of supply chains the way there is in the automotive business or the detergent business. Um, but this is a, uh, a talk, a speech, uh, an argument that I've been making for actually for all 12 years I've been at the IEB. Last year was just the, uh, the latest version of it. Um, and it's basically pinpointing that of all industry supply chains on earth, uh, probably the most porous and the most subject to small c corruption is the internet media marketing and advertising supply chain. What that means is it's very, very easy, in a way it's not easy in the automotive industry, for anyone anywhere to uh, insert himself, herself, or itself into the supply chain on the basis of one deal, one pixel, one metapixel, uh, one piece of data, and start corrupting large chunks of the way the internet itself operates. If you think of the, the virus metaphor and how viruses can become widespread on the internet, um, that's, that's true even when it doesn't involve viruses. It can involve legitimate pieces of information or data that, uh, that just simply screw things up. I like to think in terms of analogies to make this easier for people to understand. So one analogy I use pretty frequently is, imagine if any rubber company on earth, no matter how new, how immature, no matter how small C corrupt or large C criminal, could, I mean, Bob's Nigerian rubber company we operate in a basement in Lagos. Uh, imagine if they could, uh, at will, insert their tires onto the assembly lines for General Motors cars. What would happen? Well, kind of self-evidently, the next day, 
uh, you'd have a lot of dead people on the highways of the earth as tires started exploding and cars started careening into uh, each other and into guardrails. Um, this is pretty much what's been happening in various portions of uh, the internet for quite a long time. Again, because of the porousness of the supply chain, the lack of uh, kind of standards and guidelines and best practices that do guide most other industries. We can have a long debate about why they exist in other industries and not the internet, um, but the fact is that it is a, a largely unself-regulated. When I came into the IAB 12 years ago, it was very much with a, uh, a mandate that I argued to the board when they were hiring me, we needed to accomplish. And those, those are the things that we've been working. So when I say largely unself-regulated, we've been remedying that piece by piece by piece. The uh, Digital Advertising Alliance uh, Privacy Compliance Program with the CBBB, the uh, Trustworthy um, uh, Accountability Group with the Anti-Fraud Program, and various other things. But this is the latest eruption. And what it showcases is uh, several things. And I don't think it's, um, it's taken care of merely by disclosure, although I think disclosure is an important uh, part of it. Uh, the bigger one is that in any serious company environment, I think you all know this. How many people here don't, do not work for a company? Okay, so you'll all know this then. How many people work for a place that has zero suppliers? Zero partners, okay. Well, the obvious rule one in business is you have to know who your suppliers are and you have to know who your customers are. You have to know that the goods and services you're, you're getting from your suppliers are trustworthy, as fault-free as they can possibly be, as bulletproof as they can possibly be, and as far as your customers, you've gotta know that they're legitimate, that they're not serial killers, and that they'll pay their bills. So this is what we need to introduce and what we as an industry organization uh, have been working to, uh, to introduce, build on, and perfect in the, uh, the digital advertising industry. We're creating um, trust mechanisms uh, for um, suppliers, customers, and primaries. So let me ask you both the question about whether or not there is a self-correcting sort of invisible digital hand uh, that enables us all to figure out whether something is fake or not. Uh, my next door neighbor's son serves in the Coast Guard in Hawaii, and the other day he called his parents and told him, and, and essentially said goodbye to them because of the, because of the uh, notice he got from the government on, on the emergency system uh, that, that there were ballistic missiles headed toward Hawaii. It took the government, where the error occurred, 38 minutes to correct that. Uh, it was corrected on Twitter in two minutes. Um, his parents went onto Twitter and, and found out within two minutes that it was false. So generalizing from that admittedly melodramatic example, an ultimate example to everything else, is the, is the real solution to fake news wait until, until uh, uh, the crowd uh, corrects it? Or is that inadequate? Uh, I'm an old classics major, so uh, I will quote Horace in Media Race. It's in the middle of things. Um, government is not the best solution. Uh, private industry self-regulation is not the best solution. The best solution is the best solution. And I think this is a good example um, that you identified. Um, I think pretty clearly, um, either government regulation or the threat or promise of regulation can start inducing better actions on the part of private industry. Also pretty clearly, the history of regulation and self-regulation tends to show that those who are closer to the source of the problem and also closer to the technology developments can be much more adaptive much more quickly. So, you know, my sense, just from having been now in the self-regulation business um, for more than a decade and from having covered political advertising for the New York Times in years past, that there's going to be a hybrid solution that will get us closer to where we want to get. And remember, where we want to get is a place that doesn't clamp down on opinion, 
that allows strong and potentially even horrifying opinion to get out there because that's protected, um, but gives at least a degree of clarity to people that they understand where the information or the opinion is coming from. I, I, also, I agree that it's going to take both. Um, one thing I should have pointed out before is that we're really talking about two separate interests here. One is the interest for disclosure and getting information out. The other one is the foreign national prohibition. We have a law that prohibits any foreign involvement in any election in this country, going down to dog catch or up to president. Um, and so some of this is also just aimed at getting at that. And that is something that I think um, a tremendous burden can be put on um, the various platforms because, frankly, it's illegal to help somebody make a foreign national contribution or expenditure in our elections. Um, I think part of the problem with self-regulation, and it's been tried in a lot of industries, and I think in the end we end up with a balance that shifts depending on, you know, on the politics of the moment, but the problem with self-regulation is that very naturally the businesses have Yes, some public interest in mind, maybe, but they also have their bottom line in mind. And they also have um, they're very much their own self-interest. And we see this now with the reluctance for, of Facebook and, and Google to put out all their algorithms, everything that they're looking at. Um, well, you know, one of the things I think people don't think about as much is that we are not, well, I don't view myself as a, as a customer of Google or Facebook. I'm their product. Um, they're basically selling me to other people. And that's something that, that I think plays into all of this because that, in your supply chain analogy, makes them a manufacturer. Uh, and, that, and therefore, there has to be more regulation of them. I'm afraid if we leave it up to them, and this is what's happened with other industries, they will come up with something that looks good, but they're not going to tell us everything they're capable of doing. I find it hard to believe, given everything they know about us, that they really cannot do more to identify foreign nationals. They cannot do, well, first of all, as people have joked, I mean, getting money in rubles, getting paid in rubles, it should be actually a pretty good indication that you're dealing with foreign nationals. But, um, but you know, they, they can do more for this. They can also do more to require disclaimers and to make room for disclaimers on their, on their um, pages. So I think that there, it's going to be a tug, in, uh, you know, a tug back and forth about the regulation of them. Um, I also think, though, they're coming with a little bit of a burden now because they've tried to stay out of this debate for so long. You know, I'm old enough, I'm old enough to remember way before the internet, but, uh, uh, but I, you know, early on, the model was the kid sitting in his basement putting, publishing something, and wouldn't that be great for democracy? Everybody would get to say something. And it was true for about 20 minutes. Uh, and then what started to happen, as always happens in these situations, is that bigger players started to come in, and they started to use their own, um, their own guidelines for what they were going to put out there, um, who they're going to show things to, and so it's no longer really a free market. Um, it's not a free market of ideas. Um, Google censors, Facebook censors, they target, and so I think just allowing them to continue with that and say, well, trust us, we'll regulate is not going to work. I think where they have to start right now is more disclosure about what they do and how they do it. So, I, just want to, I, just, I fundamentally disagree with Larry on one premise. The idea that this is uh, not a free or at least freer market than in the past, I just think is ludicrous on its face. There is far more access to the, uh, to the means of production of content than ever before, and consumers, human beings, have vastly more access to more opinion, more ideas, more reporting, and anybody in this room who's living in a world that is now has Politico and The Hill and SCOTUS blog and every industry on earth, every segment on earth has its own 10 versions of SCOTUS blog where they didn't exist before, where you had to go through the uh, kind of the command and control centers of three television networks, one national newspaper, two at a certain point. Um, so I think I want to be, I think we need to be a little more careful with those analogies because Yes, things go wrong, but ultimately what the, uh, what the internet has done is it has allowed, and I use this quite a lot, so I apologize for repeating myself, it's allowed any 12-year-old to create a global television network with the apps that come built into her laptop or her smartphone. And I can, I can personally name at least a dozen 12-year-olds who paid for their college education by doing exactly that. So I want to be careful about loose analogies. The trick is, how do, we, how do we restrict the bad stuff but still allow the good stuff to flourish? Yeah, I would agree with you more people have access to information, but they don't necessarily have access to the information they want or they don't even know in most instances what information they're getting access to. Um, and in that sense, 
It is not when I was saying that it's freer that, that you know, the original idea that anybody would get on and blog and everybody would be able to see it. That's not, that's not the way it has turned out. You can blog, very few people are going to see it. It's just not true. I, it's, just, it's simply not true that you can, you, there are mechanisms that you can do and, and um, there are hundreds, thousands, actually, I mean, if we look at eBay and the number of people who are making their livings on eBay, the number of people who are making livings with, uh, uh, on uh, YouTube or through uh, Google, uh, uh, Google AdSense network, or on and on and on, it runs into the millions. In fact, the internet economy is 6% of total US GDP, according to John Dayton at the Harvard Business School. So again, I want to be careful. I agree with you more than 100% of that's possible, that there are fault lines in the supply chain that need to be taken care of and that the, the corruption of the information supply chain is as significant as the corruption of the automotive supply chain would be. But I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But, but we also have to recognize that those 12-year-olds or 18-year-olds who, who are making millions of, dollars a year on the, uh, millions of dollars a year on the internet are now fundamentally no different than TV shows used to be. I mean, they are sponsored, they are professionally run. Um, some of them start off in their bedrooms, but they have agents now. And so that is not the type of information that we're talking about. We're talking about um, the, the ability of people to get online, see news, and understand what they're seeing, and understand the source of it, and also then to be able to go out there and speak and be heard. So I think that's a commercial side of the internet, which I agree with you, is far broader. Um, I've sold a lot of camera equipment on the internet, so yes, it is far broader. It's the ideal. It's the uh, ideas. It's Have the, I bought any of it? No, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> we can talk later. Um, it's the ideas. It's the um, it, it's it's the. The, the concept of free individual speech that I think is not, the internet has not really um, done what we expected it to do. It has been more restrictive than we, thought, than we thought it was going to be initially. And it may be part of the market. That may have just been natural. We have a few minutes if everyone, anyone has any questions. Come on. No? You want to talk about the, uh, the global cold chain and the food industry supply chain? It's a really good analogy. No? <laughs> Go ahead and explain it. We don't have any questions. Larry, if, Larry, if, if the platforms, if the, pl oh. Go ahead. Why, why Hang on. You know why? I'll tell you why. Uh, it's because as I've kind of just reviewed uh, the history of various industries, the closest analogies I could find to, uh, to the internet are the global textile industry and the, uh, the global food industry in terms of the decentralization of the, of the value chain, the number of providers there are at the very, very, very uh, front end of the, uh, the chain, um, the globalization of it, the difficulty of using national laws to, um, uh, to control kind of a very fragmented uh, multinational business, and yet, uh, it, you know, in the food industry, going back well more than 100 years, you began to get this combination of regulation and self-regulation, creating such controls that, for example, I've used the analogy of botulism. I wish I can remember the, um, uh, the, uh, the exact numbers, but, you know, botulism in canned food is virtually non-existent, and you'd be shocked that that's possible. In the case of the textile industry more recently, the actions against uh, sweatshops have been uh, pretty profound. Certainly haven't shut down sweatshops in the, uh, the lesser developed world, but have made good action. So it's, a, it's an indication that you can get your arms around a global fragmented supply chain and turn bad things into good things. That's, that's why. So thank you for the question. Larry, you said one of the places to start is for the platforms to be more transparent about their algorithms. Um, what, would you, what do you expect us to know that we can't already understand through just the targeting that's offered to advertisers about their algorithms? And Randall, do you think that we should start there or not? So what we, what we need to know, and some of they've released, is how they target, how they know, what they know about the people who are putting on their ads. How do they, um, you know, they, they I, the image that I think a lot of people have is that people just go to them and anonymously put up an ad, and that can happen. Yes, that, but I think they also do more than that. 
Um, they help you with, um, in fact, we heard that, that they put people in both Republican and Democratic presidential campaigns. They can help you target. They can, uh, so how are they deciding how to do that? How are they deciding what information they will, they will they put out there? Are, do they have any limits to what they do, will do? Will they help somebody put out fake news? Um, and then again, with the targeting, the targeting tells us, kind of, or, or tells us what the user or, or the advertiser um, has options of doing, what, what type of thing they can do, what type of fake news they can put out there, who they can hope to reach by that. And the more we understand about what they're telling their advertisers, what information they're offering their advertisers, the more we understand about how they pick um, um, who, who to target, the more we understand about everything they know about us, I think the more we'll have a handle on how can we get at this fake news problem, how can we get at the problem of foreign nationals being involved in these ads. And I just think that vitiates the entire concept of the First Amendment, uh, which protects all, form, all those forms of speech and protects political speech even more than commercial speech. If we go where Larry is going and say, see, algorithm in the old advertising world, anybody come out of an old advertising agency? No. In the old advertising world, it was called media planning, and those were competitive secrets. You don't give away your media plan. Coke doesn't give away its media plan to Pepsi. It'll know some of it by implication, but it won't know all of it. So the idea that you have to disclose um, your targeting, your media planning, seems antithetical to, uh, to a competitive economy. Just to be clear. How I'm, about being transparent about business practices, though? That's, that's what Larry's talking, oh, yeah, talking about. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, look, I, we're in favor just, just, just so everybody understands and understands what you know, I've been talking about what I, what I uh, talked about before the, um, the House subcommittee a couple months ago, is that I think that, and we think, that companies should be extraordinarily, almost completely transparent about their suppliers and their customers. Um, I would love there to be a system or a structure whereby TAG, the Trustworthy Accountability Group, became the standard by which all supply chain relationships were transparent. Mike, guys, thanks very much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.